Wellington protest. Well, would you look at what's sprouted up here? First peaceful with veggies growing. <laughs> then dangerous with bricks hurled and fires spreading. The Wellington occupation was about vaccine mandates, but some in the protest pushed conspiracies, extremism and far-right ideology. Fresh research from the Disinformation Project says 73% of that misinformation during the occupation came from only 12 individuals. The changing narrative of the protest boiling down to what the researchers call the Aotearoa dozen. Okay, here is the report. The murmuration of information disorders. Maybe get familiar with this sort of language because connotations of mental illness built into it mean you can't really disagree with it without coming across like you suffer from it. 18 May, members of the Disinformation Project appeared in some interviews to complement the just recently released research paper. Sanjana Hatatua is with us this morning. Kate Hannah, morena Kate. They turn up in other places too, but I'm framing this thing mainly around the reporting on 18 May. You describe this as a tectonic moment. What do you mean by that? Well, it is akin to what happened in Christchurch uh, when the earthquake hit. The protest is a Christchurch earthquake moment for Aotearoa New Zealand's information and media landscape. The firmament shifted. The foundations upon which we will all engage with each other. I understand you're saying this is a major turning point, although I have to say for people who um, were families of the victims of those Christchurch earthquakes, it's perhaps not exactly comparable um, when people lost their lives. Whether it was a stupid metaphor or not, by this stage, I think TDP were too invested in the earthquake analogy to abandon it now. Well, in response to what you said, people have lost their lives because of disinformation. This is something that President Biden has said very clearly. This is something that governments the world over have said very clearly. It is something the president has said clearly. What's your message to platforms like Facebook? They're killing people. The only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. Which itself may be a little bit disinformative, but one thing at a time. Misinformation and disinformation do kill and have killed during the pandemic. So this is something quite serious and not something that is just limited to online domains. Just wanted to make that very clear. What's this guy supposed to be, the ultimate badass? And what impact did it have then on misinformation and disinformation, the, the protest itself? What kind of spikes did we see around that time specifically? Unprecedented levels of it, from the production of the content to the engagement of it. In compiling the report, though, I think not too engaged with were people who were actually there. Here is some methodology in their words. What we've done is we've looked at social media and other forms of media to try and understand where New Zealanders are getting their information from and what kind of information they're getting. We study Facebook pages and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter and YouTube and across all the platforms. Both on social media and in what we call sort of rich text artifact based mm. research. So, so um, emails and WhatsApp messages and, and booklets and, and flyers and leaflets and, and billboards that people saw around the country. And that content was being engaged with, commented on, shared, liked, uh, uh, reshared, re-edited and posted into other platforms. The paper is light on detail when it comes to how their software or technology or whatever works that could enable these people to confidently surmise tens of millions of interactions and study hundreds of hours of footage. Surely it would be an oversimplification to say that they were just scanning the online landscape for certain keywords and imagery, but I think there could be a lack of perspective from many of the people involved. We saw significant changes in, in the information ecosystems. Things I understood to be inflammatory factors seem completely left out. Trevor Mallard's tough handling of protesters at Parliament saw him turning on sprinklers and blasting music. He also issued trespass notices to former politicians. Just coming back to Trevor Mallard at the weekend, who's just making a bad situation worse, isn't he? He tried, first of all, to turn the sprinklers on at Parliament. They put road cones on top of the sprinklers and then they have funnelled, they've built channels having fun with it, aren't they? And then he tries, he thinks, oh, wow, well, goes back to his little speaker's office, what will I do? Uh, uh, and then he goes and puts the music on. <laughs> Turned what would have been a protest into now like rhythm and vines. Have a look at Trevor Mallard, by the way, surveying his kingdom. Stand down, Mr Speaker! You need to stand down! That's from the Speaker's balcony, isn't it? Oh, 
because... What is he, Caesar? Most people think he's not doing a good job. They're not going to get bored so long as immature Trevor's hanging around. Subsequently, numbers grew. This functioning commune developed, constantly embiggening. A protest getting more tense by the day. There was now a common enemy, unifying a more diverse array of groups and individuals. But Mallard's name doesn't come up a single time in the DP's research paper. Lame Duck does come up and is a given example of the violent language used. Uh, that's Mallard Bridge that the man's just walked over. They've named that. And that sort of thing, I think, could point to how detached the report's writers always were from the whole situation on the ground. Maybe they couldn't find enough decent examples of actual violent threats because that one, filth, is hardly perfect either, seeing as it famously went the other way. A whole lot more people saw and heard that. There is a river of filth. Violence and menace, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, threats to people who work in this place, things that we should not in any way be condoning, things that we should be apologists for, things that we should be overlooking with a rhetoric that it's all just good people and maybe we should talk about it and maybe we should put the mandates up for negotiation. TDP are going to blame the eventual riot on online right-wingedness though, so it's in their interest to pretend the Mallard stuff never happened. But in terms of where it was originating, you talk about the misinformation dozen. What does <laughs> that mean? So amongst the pages that we looked at, uh, uh, over 70% of the content and its engagement were linked to 12 accounts or 12 producers, which we call along the lines of the Center for Digital Hate's disinformation dozen, we call them Aotearoa New Zealand's misinformation dozen. Maybe. A bit tacky. The mimicry of the other research group. The odds that there just happened to be exactly a dozen of them so they could do the dozen name thing, which itself makes it sound like they're a gang of outlaws. Note, he says misinformation there with an M for Michael. It's done like that in the report too. We call them Aotearoa New Zealand's misinformation dozen. I'd bang on about this, but by TDP's definition, it would mean none of the dozen would have been producing that information, whatever it was, knowing it was inaccurate. Because And that's important, so remember that for later. Disinformation with a D for dinosaur. Supposedly the false information created with malice aforethought. Their definitions. Though on TV1, they do get referred to as disinformation dozen with a D. After initially, the form of information disorder gets left out entirely. They go out of their way to differentiate these words so it must matter a little bit. Like maybe having implications one day when it comes to sentencing if someone expresses a thought crime out loud. But the accusers can never really lose and the accused can never really win because inconvenient realities can just be labelled malinformation and the truth is no defence for that one. It's all pretty stupid. Amongst those 12, interestingly enough, there is one account which produced the most amount of content and was engaged with the most, for example, on the 2nd of March when the protest was shut down. Tens of thousands of concurrent viewers more than anything else comparably that mainstream media was putting out. You had a fundamentally different perspective of what was going on depending on which live stream you tuned into. If curiosity got the better of you when you heard that there was a, a riot at Parliament and you tuned into one of those live streams to see what was going on, then you may well be among those who are having their minds shaped and twisted by the misinformation dozen. These 12 are responsible for shaping the mindsets of of tens of thousands, if not much more. Responsible thing to do may have been to wait until later so an impartial journalist, one with no skin in the game, could clarify what was going on. According to TDP, unless I'm reading this wrong, which is definitely a possibility, they seem to only be just discovering now that the media are not as trusted as they once were. They give themselves away a bit as being establishment lackeys, working from a premise that mainstream media are infallible in their professionalism and objectivity, and government sources shouldn't be questioned either. Kind of implying that media and government are not independent of one another, which isn't meant to be a good thing, and probably is the reason why a whole lot of people are turning off. And people throw it at us because there is the uh, public interest journalism funding that, that people are saying, oh, you're being bought by the government, the news media. We're not. We're just uh, using it to help us um, drive journalism. They conclude that a large element of the population have become detached from reality. It's ivory tower insanity. There's this other bizarre bit too, where anti-authoritarian is listed among the bad things. I watched one of the those live streams and the reason I watched it is because it gave me a perspective inside the cordon all of the news mainstream media live streams were outside of the cordon and I know a lot of my friends were sharing that amongst themselves to say hey 
If you want to see what's going on inside, here's yeah, another camera, camera angle. It figures that far right Ryan would be part of the problem, in my opinion. Increasingly since the occupation's earlier days, there sometimes seemed to be a disconnect between a lot of the live footage and a lot of what the people at the top were saying. We have live pictures from the protest at the moment. There's a lot of anger yes. there and some legitimate threats of things there like is. execution against members of the parliament, yes. members of the media. So what do you do about yeah. that? How do you, so how do you stop that from happening? I, yeah, and I think, you know, some people have said, why don't, you know, why, why don't politicians go and address those groups or enter into some kind of negotiations? I think when you see signs calling for the execution of politicians, that's not really a group that's, that, that wants to engage in political dialogue. I think some people also may have felt like legitimate grievances weren't being addressed. Whatever point the protesters think they might have been making, they've made it, and now it's time for them to leave. Plenty of people did a lot of travelling to get there just to be arrogantly dismissed or not listened to at all. And and an overbearing vibe was coming through that the mainstream media had firmly chosen which side they were on. The three police officers that were taken to hospital this morning are reportedly doing very well, uh, doing well rather. They were sprayed by a stinging substance this morning and exactly what that substance is is yet to be determined. They've also received reports of some talk of sexual assault within uh, the protest camp. Uh, police say that they had intelligence that some of the protesters were planning on throwing human waste at them again. Again this morning. We're reporting that there's looting, raping, and yes, even acts of cannibalism. You, you've actually seen people looting, raping, and eating each other. No, no, we haven't actually seen it, Tom. We're just reporting it. Plenty of allegations from the authorities that shitty things were going on at the protest, but I'm not sure how much of any of that was completely verified. The sort of stuff you'd think would be easily provable. Some other evidence out there may have been short on context sometimes, but it will have generated some sympathy for the protesters, even though some of them were making crazy misinformed allegations like that the police were utilizing ultrasonic LRAD sound cannons on them. I mean, that doesn't even sound like it's a thing. If I saw that in some sci-fi movie, I'd be like, oh shit, I'd turn it off. It would, I cannot, this is too unrealistic. You know, if something's just happened and people are claiming they know for certain what's just happened, they probably don't. But the reason the occupation came to be in the first place was to protest vaccine mandates, which of course the government expressly denied would ever be implemented until of course that did end up happening. Both yourself and Minister Hipkins said that the vaccinations would never be forced on anyone and yet the mandates have come. Some people will have seen at the time that the mainstream coverage wasn't really giving the protesters a fair shake of the stick. So maybe as an onlooker, it was best to just keep an open mind. Police have confirmed they used two controversial sonic cannons on protesters at Parliament. Vindication, like with the mandate thing, didn't come until a while later and nobody was especially apologetic about it. Worsening already fraught media trustworthiness. While they claim the devices were used safely, they've been abandoned in some countries after seriously damaging people's hearing. We do um, feel concerned that New Zealand police are increasingly using experimental methods that are violent without a social license that does amount to tyranny. So going back, maybe it didn't have to take until riot day for some people to consider the live streamers on the inside could have been as reliable, maybe even more so, than the mainstream analysis outside. But the report doesn't look like it makes much of an attempt to appreciate that progression of distrust pertaining to this whole situation. To see the community that they experienced and then for us to observe it externally was the imagery and language that you know you as media and, and that we observed that was violent, that was um, distressing and harmful, that included death threats, that saw schoolgirls harassed in the streets, and then to see the splintered reality of what was being talked about from within the community of of a community of peace and love. TDP claims to have studied hundreds of hours of footage, but obviously the vast majority of footage in existence was taken on the days of those clashes with police. That was two days out of 23 or four or something. Any more than 24 hours spent on a single day would mean that you're just looking at the same stuff happening but from a different position and angle and so you uh, you would pick up new stuff obviously but still would TDP have had the discipline to um to study all those 20 or so peaceful days I can see we've had another delivery of a skip bag and uh, we've had we have had people donating gas bottles full gas bottles and those have been very much appreciated for the people running the barbecue here cup Kai. I don't know, I'm just asking questions. To see the splintered reality of what was being talked about from within the community of, of a community of peace and love. Do it again, do it again! Yeah! And one more time! Yeah! <laughs> oh, so every time someone walks through the gazebo, they are getting a round of applause, guys. How can you not grin from ear to ear? Yeah! <laughs> Freedom!
Oh my god, I just want to stay there forever, it's so funny. The love and peaceful people are characterised as deluded or living in an alternate reality because of some of the bad apples out there. But as a side note, reality may not get too much more subjective than it does when defining love and peace to a lesser extent. There is a river of genuine fascism in parts of the event that we see out the front of this parliament today. And I just urge colleagues in this House, decent and honourable members of the centre-right parliamentary parties in this parliament, that a lot is actually on them to not give succour and comfort to an emergent and dangerous far-right movement. Is it fascinating to you that we got to that point, or is it completely unsurprising? To a certain extent it's completely unsurprising, it's what we had expected. I think it's possible their research found exactly what it wanted to find. Even a bit of smug sarcasm comes through. I mean, there's a time and place. What was surprising is the very, very quick way in which those key narrators of disinformation were able to shift the message away from that particularly focus on, on mandates and vaccines to broader issues. So, the key narrators of disinformation apparently stopped dwelling so much on vaccinations and mandates and shifted to other stuff. And all of that came to a head with the riot at Parliament. The disinformation project says this small group is what drove the transition from a peaceful protest to a violent clash with police. But maybe take that with a grain of salt, because a couple of weeks after that interview, TDP went on TV again to say the pivot is now in the six weeks since the riot. They say disinformation groups have pivoted following the anti-mandate protests to issues like co-governance. This expert says following the anti-mandate protest at Parliament, disinformation groups have shifted focus. Remember, there's been two pivots, once during the time frame of the Wellington protest culminating with the riot, and then once in the six weeks since then. We've been monitoring specifically a rise in anti-Māori sentiment for over a year now, but most recently in the last six weeks there has been a, a significant increase. It's a bit like they're the ones changing the narrative of the timeline of the other changing narrative. We did expect that there would be an uptick in racism and we have seen that. Traditionalist or reactionary ideas um, about you know, the use of te reo Māori, uh, co-governance, um, gender and sexuality, the role of women. It's particularly around ideas of co-governance, uh, around notions of here, Pua Pua, the Māori Health Authority. Broadly speaking, anti-Māori issues across both pivots, though she mentioned gender issues as well during the first pivot. Maybe gender was part of the second pivot too, but she neglected to mention it. The bottom line is, but, but really, you can't pivot two times, especially if it's to the same thing. It's not even a pivot if you're just pivoting to the same thing you've already pivoted to, otherwise the, the whole pivoting process is redundant. You're just going around in circles. They've said that the anti-Māori sentiment, that's the thing that the, both pivots have been pivoting to, that started happening last year and the momentum has been gaining since then. So that was sort of happening anyway. So all the pivots are redundant. The whole, if there was just one huge prolonged pivot and we were in the midst of it now, that would make more sense. Well, that could make sense, I guess. I don't know. More than the other thing. Maybe. The interesting thing within all of that, though, is that actually a lot of the people that were at the anti-mandate protest were part of those minority groups as well, who were being fed information or misinformation from people who didn't necessarily agree with them. But it's just this echo chamber that you get into, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's why we need to kind of identify and name those people who were benefiting from or focusing power in on gathering an audience in a community. I think this analysis always did require a great big unexplained logical shortcut. No doubt some people were out there and online spreading intolerance occasionally or even relentlessly, but where is the actual connection to the riot drawn? How did 12 people end up with such a large reach and how did that influence what happened offline at the protests themselves? Hypothetical question. I don't think it ever gets properly answered unless the evidence comes from reading signs in the crowd and stuff matching it up. I seriously put effort into trying to understand their conclusion. There were a flurry of people talking about police brutality on Telegram, but I think the perception of police brutality would come before the accusation of it. It's um, not necessarily, but a massive spike in online viewership occurred on that day. Again, I would have thought likely a result of the riot rather than the cause of it. The day after the riot, online content and viewership dropped dramatically. I guess it shows a relationship between 
online action and offline action. That is, that people aren't going to log on to see something offline if the offline thing isn't happening. The protest was over, there was nothing to watch online anymore, so people weren't logging on to watch nothing, and that sort of evidence I guess they give. So yeah, were white supremacist echo chambers motivating all this? People acting as per the instruction of racist online agitators who openly hated them. Our Māori communities have been the targets of a very active and organised misinformation campaign, some of which uh, has been fuelled by white supremacists. With few exceptions, that chamber over there sounded pretty echoey during this whole thing. And whatever the divergent views outside were, people did seem united in their unhappiness toward them. I think it's not so hard to believe the anger boiling over at the end could have been because these people had their makeshift society that they'd built up, be invaded and trampled on in some bad faith morning raid. Take your belongings and leave Parliament now. Take your belongings, how? In one second, pack down a whole tent and everything. Is that what she's calling for? Police cleared half the grounds before all hell broke loose. The fires started. But shit, I don't know, I wasn't there. So where do we go from here, Kate? How do we how do we fix this? Well, where we go from here is we have to have really, really honest conversations in a way that perhaps we're a bit uncomfortable with yep. as New Zealanders. So it ends with 45 seconds of impractical asinine claptrap. That sounds very nice. Whereas the AM show interview didn't end on the same cherry note. We were told at the time that this was imported extremism. Was it? Were these overseas-based um, <laughs> accounts? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting question. In terms of the followers, it's an Im almost an impossible task for independent researchers because we don't have access to that data. The surge in online views and followers were somewhat core to the alarm, the tectonic shift and all that, but it didn't look like it could be confirmed whether those followers were NZ-based or not. I think adding to my speculation that the DP engaged with a lot more text-based artifacts than actual human beings. What I can assure you is that the predominant dis and missing for producers those accounts are all domestic accounts. Right. Uh, so different to uh, what we were being told at the time. Report researcher Sanjana Hatatua, thanks very much for being with us this morning with your research. Thank you very much. Interesting. That, I guess, which I guess makes the Prime Minister guilty of misinformation at the time, <laughs> doesn't it? Because she told us it was all imported. We were told that, yeah. <laughs> so there you go, misinformation everywhere. May have been a harmless observation, but the doctor seemed to become offended that Ryan Bridge extrapolated some indirect criticism of Prime Minister Ardern, who was also a doctor. The report, probably flattering of the Prime Minister, if anything, kicks off on page one by quoting her. A bit of wisdom to get us rolling. There you go, misinformation everywhere. So this is interesting. The doctor became appalled, noting so to the producers before hanging up on them, and in a devastating final blow, he vowed to never again appear on their program. Maybe it was the other channel, TV1, they should have been more mad at. This is the Facebook version of that interview, the one on the internet that was shared all over the world. Fresh research from the Disinformation Project says 73% of that misinformation during the occupation came from only 12 individuals. Eagle-eyed observers may have noted that the Aotearoa doesn't actually appear to be 13 individuals. And only four or five of them are actually individuals. Though that last thing isn't the DP's fault. I mean, they're not single individuals. It's, it's the kind of clusters yeah. of individuals, so it's not just 12 people. There's still 13 of them, though, and the whole thing's a little bit silly. The captions coming up at the bottom don't seem to form a coherent message. And in the example they give of one of those misinformation, disinformation people, maybe you have to squint a little bit, but it looks like this is depicting a situation where she herself is the target of a false ID name, stealing bad information spread of person, and she's warning people. I guess someone's out to get her. Statistically, 73% likely to be one of these people. Do remember that even though somebody has got a, you know, a media profile, they're just a human being, um, and it's not very nice to pretend to be somebody and take over their persona. So maybe not the best example to have used. And TV1 may have got off lightly because of the utter disrespect shown by TV3. Who want to go around bookmarking their interviews with inane banter of all things? Surely not what people want to see on their weekday morning TV shows. I guess I'd say he doesn't have a sense of humor. If one were to further externally analyze the engagement on social media, which is how the scientific process works these days, it seemed like the problem was that the Prime Minister was invoked at all in a negative light. That she herself could have spread misinformation in the past. Which I guess makes the Prime Minister guilty of misinformation. Because she told us it was all important. We were told that. <laughs> By historically suggesting some aspect or element of the
the protest was imported, which in many ways is exactly what she has done. What I've seen here has not been, you know, a new, the way that we're used to seeing protests in this country. It feels like um, an imported protest. To me, it looks like an imported style of protest that I have not seen in New Zealand before, complete with Trump flags and Canadian flags. Might be a couple of qualifying words in there, but judge for yourself. The final thing I'd say is there has all the way through been an element to this occupation that has not felt like New Zealand, and that's because it's not. There has been foreign influence in what we've seen, uh, maybe not in the traditional terms that we know it, but in terms of the disinformation that has been sourced out of other countries. That is something that we will have to tackle, but so too will other democracies. I don't think anybody ever alleged that the protesters were literally North Americans or Eastern Europeans who travelled across the sea for the purpose of protesting outside New Zealand's parliament. Beautiful. But whether it's right or wrong, people have been postulating foreign instigation all over the show. He used his IT skills to find out where the online misinformation was coming from. Tracing the servers back then through to Moscow. TDP have talked about it in the past. We saw much more hardcore stories coming out that, that were promoting disinformation and they were coming from the UK and from Europe and from the US and targeting New Zealanders. Still to this day. The change of the New Zealand election cycle drew us into closer alignment with the US election cycle and mm. much more US based disinformation started coming into New Zealand and being consumed by New Zealanders. Whether it's true or not, we are constantly seeing these sorts of allegations. So who knows why TDP need to be so sensitive about Ryan Bridges' throwaway chuckle. That, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a bit too Tucker Carlson y for them. <laughs> But what bloody difference does it make anyway? Other than TDP were embarrassed. They dropped the ball and their fervor to do the copycat doesn't name thing. We're not taking the ottoman. It's superfluous and I hate it. You're tacky! And they've blurted out the conclusion at odds with the government. So we get to see in real time the disinformation project insisting they're correct despite contradicting the prime minister who was also correct and those two despite just repeating the exact same thing they are incorrect because one could perceive that their intent was to make the prime minister look bad. It's all pretty stupid, and I do wonder if this group could come across as having a very partisan way of looking at the world. And you see around the place there are other hints to that effect, like a snipe at Fox News. MAGA and pro-Trump people going on the enemy list, reference to Michelle Obama as the forever first lady. Then you got them putting the current US president on a pedestal. This is something that President Biden has said very clearly. There's that obsequious attitude to direction from the establishment in general, their sensitivity to criticism of the prime minister, and the way they premise their research paper on some trite ardernism. As seen recently, with light being shed on the third Swarbrick docudrama, whatever you want to call it, this, mel, or misinformation, can apparently simply be things that another person doesn't want to hear. There's an unsatisfiable burden of evidence falling on people whose existing evidence already provided doesn't even need to be outright denied anymore. Due to some perceived insinuation, it's inconvenient for another person to have to wrap their mind around. You can just go, that's, fuck that, that's misinformation. Mel information blurs in with the other variants of information disorder as a catch-all to seal the deal. There's good information information and there's bad information and nothing will need to make sense when the authorities can ultimately determine what's allowed to be true or not. They've recently added an additional layer of protection to this end. Today we launch a national centre of research excellence for preventing and countering violent extremism. Headed by people who have made their politics pretty clear in the past, indicating the competence we can expect from them and how loosely they're going to be defining extremism and why wouldn't spreading information disorder be regarded extremism? Because remember, people have lost their lives because of disinformation. Misinformation and disinformation do kill and have killed. The memoration of information disorders. If you found it TL and you DR it, doing meta searches through arbitrarily selected products and platforms, we compiled enough racist and misogynistic material to deduce through some temporary upticks in online engagement and legacy media's declining ratings that these protesters were akin to a Trojan horse being used by puppet masters, driven by a desire for shit to eventually hit the fan so some opportunists could get in there and light up the playground on the parliament forecourt. The ordeal will leave trash everywhere and kill all the grass and that would somehow be a win for white supremacy and sexism. After a short celebration they'll presumably move on to the next high profile park or playground and then the next, using their pawns to set up tent cities that will frustrate the locals until the police have to be called and everyone gets evicted. There'll be heaps of litter to pick up and heaps of grass will get singed along the way until social cohesion has been substantially eroded. The nation's brightest minds will tell us that inequality is a bad thing and we really should have done something about it. But a lot of us sort of already did know that and anyway by then it will be too late and we pretty 
pretty much have to start over if we want society to be equitable like it was before the protest. But even after acknowledging all this, there is no catharsis. The online disinformation spread as punishment will continue to elude them, and we gain no deeper understanding of why some people respect them more than us. No new knowledge will be extracted from our research. This report has meant nothing. Well, I'm not an expert in mental health.